Welcome back. My name is Joel Duff of the naturalhistorian.com and this YouTube channel. And I come to you today with this rather provocative title, Did Adam and Eve Have Tails? Well, Ken Ham says no, but I'm going to ask the question, how does he know? After all, was he there? It's really a tale of molecular genetics. And so let's talk about uh, what inspired me to ask this question. Uh, and then we're going to look at a very, what I think is a very interesting molecular genetics paper and get, you know, pretty uh, science nerdy with it. But it's something that, uh, you know, has some data in it that I think that uh, needs to be considered before answering this question. Did Adam and Eve have tails? Why did I even think of the question about whether Adam and Eve have tails? It seems like a, a silly question. Uh, it seems like, well, of course they didn't have tails. But then as I began to think about it, I, I started to realize, well, why not? Um, why couldn't Adam and Eve have had tails? What would be the evidence that they didn't have tails? What would be the evidence that they did have tails in the past? And we're going we're gonna to look at some of that evidence here. Um, one of the things that Ken Ham did was, and, and the whole reason I even thought of it is because of this Ken Ham tweet in which he points to an article that uh, some baby in Brazil was born with a tail. Uh, and he's going to note that this isn't really a tail. This is a, a, um, uh, a, a birth defect uh, in which uh, the end of the neural cord um, it, you know, inappropriately grows a fatty tissue and actually has like a blob of tissue on the end. Uh, and there's some muscle in there, but it's not well differentiated. Uh, and so he has his uh, anatomist at, at the uh, Anchors and Genesis uh, proclaim that this isn't homologous or the same thing as a tail that is found in, say, other monkeys or really all other <laughs> mammals, uh, for that matter. And so this isn't really a tail. This is all just a tail, T-A-L-E, right? An evolutionary tail. And bringing up these um, these things that are the result of you know, mal, uh, malformations, right, which in his mind are the result of sin and decay of the human body and having mutations and mistakes. This is simply a mistake that creates a birth defect that results in something that looks like a tail uh, growing out of um, these, these babies uh, that's usually removed, uh, surgically removed, and doesn't have any uh, long-term effect uh, on the child. All right, so the money quote from the from his blog on Answers in Genesis is, such sensational headlines are intended to reinforce evolutionary ideas or evolutionary tales, he should have said, uh, and shock people. And, of course, the Fox News article itself is sort of meant to shock people, right? Because it says in the, in the title, shocking human tale removed from newborn. Now, uh, you know, it's easy for me to dismiss this because I, I, I kind of agree with Ken Ham that uh, these evidences of human tales um, really shouldn't be used as evidence for evolutionary biology. Um, and, you know, anyone who's making a big deal about this is, is th these, these malformations are not truly homologous in the sense to uh, animal tales, but there's a lot more to this story, and there's a lot more that that, that Ken Ham isn't, I think, telling his audience. And I, I, as I began to think about it, I began to ask the question to myself, right, Ken Ham seems to be sure that uh, humans can't have tails. And then I asked myself a really simple question, why can't, why couldn't humans have had tails at one time in the past? Is there something anti-biblical about that? Uh, I don't see any descriptions in the Bible of Adam and Eve that describe them without tails, nor do I see them described with tails. Um, and we have very few, we don't really have any records of what people looked like before the flood, right? Uh, what does it mean to be made in God's image? Uh, how do we know whether God has a tail or not, right? And so the, the, the lack of evidence doesn't mean that Adam and Eve had tails, but the lack of evidence also means you can't just automatically assume that they didn't. And what I'm going to argue in over the next few minutes here, uh, and especially when I show you some interesting molecular genetic evidence, is that young earth creationists like Ken Ham might be better off to suggest that Adam and Eve had tails and they simply have lost their tails over time. After all, wouldn't that just be a degeneration, uh, a loss of characters, kind of like the appendix, you know, it had more function in the past and through mutations due to sin and genetic entropy and this world falling apart, 
uh, they're always telling us, right? They're always telling people in their literature that um, Adam and Eve are, you know, after sin, subjugated their descendants to mutations which have been corrupting the human genome. And therefore, we have lost some capacities that we had in the past. Uh, couldn't one of those capacities have been actually growing a tail and through some mutation, loss of that ability to grow the tail? That wouldn't be something that any um, young earth creationist uh, geneticist should oppose, right? They should, they should suggest that as a possibility that such a character could have existed in the past and have been lost uh, into the present. All right, so that's setting the stage for what we're going to now talk about, which is some of the evidence for whether tails could have existed in the past and how they might actually be lost. Uh, and then we'll consider at the end uh, several different hypotheses that young earth creationists need to consider to be able to explain um, this data that I'm going to show you. All right, what's the first thing? What's the first observational piece of evidence that you need to consider? As I thought about this, I thought, you know, tails are a universal feature of vertebrates, right? And human beings are a type of vertebrate. We have vertebrae, right? So what do we observe? We do observe that all vertebrate animals have tails at some point during their life, right? Uh, if, if you have a, an exception to that, I'd be really interested in that. You could put that in the comments. Uh, maybe I'm not thinking of an exception to that rule. Um, but as far as I can tell, vertebrates, say fish all the way up to human beings, all right, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, all have tails at some point during their development. Now, I'm going to show you. So embryologically, um, every single one of these, so a turtle, a, fit, a turtle is a, a, a reptile, a chicken is a bird, right? Cows are mammals. Humans are a, a form of mammal or classified as mammals. And if you look embryologically at a particular stage in embryo development uh, or fetal development, you'll find that there is a tail and, and that tail has a series of vertebrae. In the case of human beings, between eight weeks and 10 weeks in development, um, there are eight to 10 vertebrae that begin to form, forming this tail uh, structure. Uh, and that tail structure eventually in the human embryo and a fetus and growing fetus eventually is absorbed. Well, absorbed is just a fancy way for saying that the cells of that particular tail are programmed to die. Uh, and as they die, the material in that tail is recycled and used elsewhere in the embryo for in, in development. But there is a true tail there. Now, when I say true tail, that's different than what I was mentioning before about human beings that are born with these things that look like tails that are um, uh, genetic defects uh, resulting in these weird growths uh, at the end of the spine, uh, resulting in these uh, fleshy uh, objects which are tail-like. But as uh, Answers in Genesis itself and Dr. Menton at Answers in Genesis said, a true tail has vertebra in it, right? And it would have a muscle structure and able to move. Uh, actually, some of those pseudo tails or fake tails actually are able to move. They have muscles in them. Uh, but, but, I, but admittedly, they don't have vertebra in them. They don't have, they're not bony structures. And so if we were to say that a true tail is a bony structure, well, at this point in development uh, in humans, at this point, there is a tail, all right? And that tail has the beginnings of, of muscular structure and vertebra beginning to form in very early forms. Uh, and so this would true, this is a true tail. It's homologous to tails, meaning it's the same type of structure. It's the same thing that's found in all other vertebrate organisms. So for example, even chickens have a fairly lengthy tail in embryo, but of course, men, much many of those vertebra disappear. They use a few of those vertebra to make the, the uh, I can never pronounce this, but the, the, the pigo style. Uh, which is a fused bony structure where the, the tail feathers are added, um, but it has muscles attached, which allow it to move the tail feathers around for flight and so forth. Um, and so that's their form of tail. Uh, and so as I, you know, as we're, as we're pointing out, all vertebrates actually do have tails. So if you just want to, if you don't want to be perfectly accurate, you have to say that uh, human beings do have tails. They just don't have tails when they're adult organisms, right? or really even very young organisms. 
uh, young or organisms sounds there when they're young individuals. So my second observation is that virtually all vertebrate animals have tails as adults, right? Just go through uh, in your mind all the different kinds of animals you can think of and think about if they have a tail or not. And so the exceptions to this would be there are a few amphibians. So many frogs don't have uh, any true tail uh, at in the adult stage. But of course, in the polywog stage, they clearly have a tail, right? Uh, and even have uh, small, soft uh, bones in it. And among mammals, there are a couple bat species, but some of those bat species have very close relatives that answers in Genesis would say are the same kind of organism that have tails. And so you have some sister species that don't have tails. So that looks like a case of losing tails, right? So that, that in itself should be evidence to young earth creationists that it's possible to have a tail in original kind and lose the ability to make a tail. Um, and, and if they want to call that a loss of information, you know, then so be it. But it's, it's nonetheless, it's the loss of a character uh, that was in the original created kind of, say, some kind of bat. And then, of course, the, the big exception, all right, which is probably the best known exception, would be the primates, in which gibbons, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and, uh, or I'm missing there, orangutans, right, and human beings all lack the ability to, or the, the, the all lack tails as adults. And so this, as any biologist would look at this situation, which is say 99.9% .9 of species, vertebrate species on earth, uh, both that are alive today and in the fossil record, because we can see tails in the fossil record, 99.9% .9 of them have tails as adults. And so therefore, it raises the very interesting question or natural question, uh, why don't human beings have tails? And why don't some of the animals that we observe don't have tails? Why don't they have them? What makes them different? And in the, in the era of genomics, in which we can look into genes and try to understand what actually makes a tail, right? What actually makes those characteristics? What's the genetic information that does that? We can then begin to probe the question, what is it about human beings and really uh, other primates that make them different than even other primates that have tails? What is it genetically that makes them different? And that's the thing that we're going to, we're going to spend a considerable amount of time on. So why don't human beings have tails as adults? Right, from the young earth perspective, two different hypotheses, right? God either made Adam and Eve without tails right from the beginning, right? When God made Adam and Eve, uh, and formed him from the dust of the ground. He created, uh, well, created Adam from the dust of the ground. Uh, he formed them with no tail as an adult, although apparently um, all of his offspring would make tails uh, early in development, right? But not have tails at the adult stage. Um, so created him with the ability to make a tail, at least a preliminary tail, but not complete that into an, a, a, a fully developed uh, tail. All right, so that's one hypothesis. Second hypothesis, God made Adam and Eve with tails as adults, right? If you had been there, like, like, like Ken Ham likes to say, you know, were you there? Well, if he had been there and seen Adam and Eve, maybe they would have had a full-blown uh, tail as an adult as they're walking around. But their ancestors lost that particular morphological feature. You know, whether it was their direct descendants or maybe multiple lines down the road, probably maybe before the, the flood. Uh, so that time you get to the, the time you get to know and his sons, they don't have tails. Uh, and so everybody after the flood lacks um, this tail, which was an original feature. Uh, of the of humankind, um, the other uh, option, all right, is that adult tails were never expressed in humans, but possibly the physical bodies of the human ancestors. So this would be an option where Adam and Eve are representatives, or the first two individuals that give rise to all people, but they come from a pool of of pre hominids, uh, pre humans, and they don't have tails either. Right, and they don't have tails, maybe because they're related to other primates that also don't have tails. 
uh, so maybe sometime more distantly in the past, they lost their tails versus, v, you know, via mutations and natural selection. And, you know, option number two for the young earth creationists that they started out with tails and then lost them in their descendants, that's going to require some kind of explanation for how that happened, like mechanistically how that would happen. Uh, and the mechanism might actually be very similar to option number three, just the timing would be different, right? The timing would be in the last four thousand, you know, last 6,000 years versus the other option, which might be a long time ago, you know, primates lost their tails or hominoid primates lost their tails. Okay, now with that uh, setup, I gotta give you my warning, all right? Super geeky molecular genetic stuff is coming up. We're gonna take a deep dive into a rather complicated molecular genetics paper. Uh, and I'm going to attempt to explain um, some really difficult genetic concepts. Uh, but I think if you stick with me, I think the payoff will be pretty good. And, and even if you disagree with the, with the interpretations that I'll, I'll end up with at the end, um, I, you might benefit just from the gen molecular genetics of this. Um, Stuff. And I think you should just find it fascinating. I, I find this stuff really fascinating uh, to think about. All right, so super geeky stuff coming up. So first, let's talk about the gene that we're going to be discussing. So we're going to discuss a particular gene on a particular place in the genome that has been implicated for its critical role in early development uh, of, well, actually, it's called the the... the the primary streak. I, I had to think about that for a moment. The primary streak, which is uh, one of the first stages of development uh, where the cells are going to start to reorganize themselves from being sort of chaotic and unorganized into a more organized state, uh, which will then eventually become the vertebra or the backbone uh, of a mammal uh, or really of all bilateral organisms. So this gene, TBXT, is more commonly called uh, brachyuri, which means short tail. <laughs> so, and why is it called short tail? It's called short tail because in it, of his discovery in 1927 in what were mouse defects. Uh, so mice that had short tails or no tails. Uh, now this is before we knew what genes really were in terms of their DNA code and things like that. So this is sort of like uh, Mendel, like uh, identifying a characteristic and then uh, giving it a, a trait. And now we know there's a particular gene that's, that provides that particular trait. Um, and now we know that the that brachyura and the short tail is actually a mutation uh, that causes this particular defect. So where is this gene found? It's found in all bilateral organisms or animals. Uh, those are animals that exhibit bilateral symmetry, which is basically almost all animals. So sponges don't have bilateral symmetry, but virtually all other organisms uh, that are more complicated than a sponge uh, have bilateral symmetry. And what does this gene do? TBXT gene is a transcription factor. All right. And so a transcription factor is responsible for controlling transcription of genes. All right, what do you need to know about transcription of genes? In order to read, let's say I need some insulin. All right. You have a gene, uh, a piece of code in your DNA that holds the information for making that molecule. You're going to need to transcribe it from your code. Uh, and so that means go in and make a copy of it. Right? So you have to go get a copy of the information from your nucleus, and you're going to bring the information out of your nucleus to the cytoplasm outside the nucleus where the ribosomes are, and the ribosomes are the machine that reads, we call it translates, translates the code of your DNA into the code of amino acids, which make a protein. Now, this is something slightly different. TBXT gene is a transcription factor, meaning it is a protein that actually helps control where you do transcription, whether you turn on transcription and turn off transcription. In other words, it's a transcription controller. And if you want to think of it this way, it's a gene which can um, influence how programs run. All right? If you think of genes as programs, this is, a, this is a protein that's made by a gene called TBXT gene. Once this gene is transcribed and translated into a protein, it then influences a bunch of other genes. And so it influences 
turning on and turning off genes. Now, what are you doing in early development? There are certain genes you need to turn on in order to stimulate certain forms of development early in the embryo's existence. And then at some point you need to turn those genes off, right? Because you can't continue to use some of the same genes that only had a job. Their only job was to do like X. And that job only happens on the fifth day of development in a particular organism's life, right? And so that gene needs to be turned on, but then it needs to be turned off. And so genes like this, TBXT, which are transcription factors, just meaning they're, they're factoring into the transcription, they're influencing transcription. There's one of the things that's controlling the running of programs. And so that's why this is gonna be a really important gene. Um, you, if you, if you affect how this gene functions, you have a lot of downstream effects, meaning this gene affects a bunch of other genes, or you can think of it as this gene affects a bunch of other programs. If you mess this gene up, you mess a bunch of different programs up and you can create really different downstream effects, like potentially the loss of a tail, right? Because it's responsible for making the, the initial stages of starting to make a vertebrate uh, and it's sample. All right, so now let's get to the particular paper that we want to discuss. And this paper is very new. Uh, this uh, was published on um, the uh, biology preprint server, it's called, on September 16th, 2021. Now, what the preprint server is, is this means that this was uploaded to a place where scientists all over the world can see this manuscript. And that's what it is. It's a manuscript. It's not been published in a peer-reviewed paper, uh, but it's being made public to everyone and you know people can comment on it. It's a kind of a way of getting some feedback on your paper, like, oh, you didn't think of this, or you know, here's a criticism of it. Then you might make some corrections on it before you actually send it to a peer-reviewed journal where it's going to be reviewed by a couple specific people in your field. Uh, and, and so I, I saw this article and it's already been talked about, and I haven't seen any major criticisms of it. Uh, people seem to agree the science looks pretty good, and I would assume that's in peer review now, and eventually will find its way into uh, official publication. So this is not an officially peer-reviewed paper. Nonetheless, I think that um, the data here is pretty strong uh, and certainly worth talking about. And it's, it's like, like I said, this is really new because of this. All right, now here, we're going to have to spend a little time on this particular figure. This is figure one from the paper. Oh, let, let me go back. Let's talk about this paper a little more first. Uh, the genetic basis of tail loss evolution in human and apes. Uh, and I, I'm not really going to stress the tail loss, the evolution part of this. I'm most interested in just the, 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 the how this gene acts and works and the types of things they did to show how changing this gene can change whether something makes a tail or doesn't make a tail. And so it's the genetic basis of it. So we're gonna look at the, gen the genes involved, in this case, one specific gene, uh, in both humans and apes. And we're gonna, we're gonna focus uh, mostly on the situation in human beings. Uh, a whole bunch of authors, and I just wanna point out that the authors come from a variety of different institutions, but they also do different things. So we have computational medicine, uh, systems, genetics, uh, molecular pharmacology, we have neuroscience and physiology, we have pathology because errors in this particular gene creates different pathological conditions, uh, one of which is loss of tail <laughs> in certain organisms. Um, and then we also have some engineering and so forth. So what we have is a mixture of people with different expertises uh, that are interested in looking at um, a very important developmental gene because developmental genes can be, you know, mistakes in developmental genes have long-term ramifications for the health of an organism. Uh, and of course, human beings are at the central focus of that, but people study this particular gene in many different types of organisms to try to understand early development. Because as I said before, all bilateral animals have this particular gene and they're all using it in kind of a similar fashion. Uh, especially mammals, which essentially are using it exactly the same way. And so you can study almost any mammal to try to understand uh, what this gene is doing. Okay, now we're ready for the complicated figure. So let's start out by, uh, I'm going to give you kind of a synopsis of, of kind of the, 
you know, how they got started thinking about this problem, the data that they observed, and then they observed, they made an obs a really interesting observation, and then they followed that up with a bunch of lab experiments to try to test their own hypotheses. Uh, so first of all, they have um, figure 1A is just a representation reminding everyone who doesn't have a tail, and it's this group right here. Right, so we've got gibbons, we have orangutans, we have um, we have gorillas, we have chimpanzees, and we have humans, and all of them lack any obvious tail uh, formation as adults. Whereas, you know, it's not hard to think of monkeys that have tails, right? I mean, we kind of almost think of that as a characteristic uh, of of monkeys, uh, and it's it's a really clear distinction between what we call apes usually versus monkeys, uh, lack of a tail. There are actually a bunch of other characteristics which uh, this group up here shares, um, like trichromatic vision and so forth. So are, there are other distinctions between the different kinds of primates. All right, so that's, that's, that's sort of like the problem. The problem is this group doesn't have a tail. The question then is, why don't they have a tail? Can we actually figure out what it is about development that doesn't result in making a tail? Because as I already pointed out, like everybody already knows by looking at embryonic development that all of these animals, right? Every single one of these uh, different kinds of primates and human beings, right? All have a tail that looks really the same in embryo embryo embryologically. So at a certain point in their life, they all have a tail. But then one group of these uh, doesn't complete the formation of a mature tail, whereas the other ones do. And so there must be some difference in the developmental pathways, and developmental pathways are influenced by genes, right? Controlled by genes being turned off and on. So they wanted to know, can we find which genes are involved in this process that makes this difference? Um, now, there are dozens and dozens of genes that are already known to be involved in the development of chordates, right? The, the, the backbone, the nervous system, and there, that's why neurologists are involved and so forth in this project. Uh, and lots of work has been done on all kinds of different mammals to understand early development. And so there was a suite of a bunch of genes that could be looked at. And then, so what they did is they said, look, we have all these genomes now, right? The world is full of genomes where we've sequenced entire organisms. We know their entire code. And so we can take all those genes, we can look at them and, and ask ourselves, is there something different? Can we find something different in this group that in those particular genes, which we, we know are critical for De tail development or anatomical development early in the embryonic development process versus this group. And they were kind of disappointed at first because they took this suite of genes, they lined them all up, and what they found was, eh, there's nothing obvious here. It's like the sequence from you know a lemur is essentially the same as a sequence from a human being for all those genes. And so we can't really see how any of you know, these might, there are minor differences. Of course, there's like an A here, a T there, but it doesn't seem to change an amino acid. And they seem to make it the pretty much the same protein. If they make the same protein, well, they're probably doing the same function with it, right? And they were kind of left with, eh, there's really not a whole lot here going on. We can't, we, we, there's no obvious change in the actual genes themselves. The code itself for the genes doesn't seem to be that different, not only between primates, but if you compare a human being with any other mammal, eh, they're essentially the same gene. And here's the gene. So let's actually, let's look at C first. Um, here's the structure of the gene. Um, so quick reminder, uh, genes are, uh, are a portion of nucleic acid code, A, T, Cs, and Gs, that uh, are read and turned into, usually read and turned into, or the information for making a protein. And as I've said in other lectures, if you've listened to me, the, the way that we organize our genes is rather complex in eukaryotic organisms, of which we are one. All right, we have a nucleus. Uh, and so these little boxes right here, this represents the code. 
So that's a, you know, this is several hundred base pairs. This is a hundred base pairs. This is a couple hundred base pairs. And then we have like 500 base pairs here, some more here. One, two, three, four, actually it's five. Um, five, six, seven uh, pieces of DNA, well, and then eight. And all of those have to be combined together like this, squished together in order to make the gene. That's the actual reading code. So the colorful boxes are the actual code that's read. That's the information. Well, what's in between? What's in between are called introns, I-N-T-R-O-N-S. And that stands for intervening sequences because they intervene in between the code of the actual gene. And those pieces are taken out. So if we take those out and put these two pieces together, eventually we'll make the gene. And so this is a, a, a process that has to occur. Before you read your code into a protein, you've got to process your original gene in your nucleus, and you have to splice out these introns and then put all the pieces together. And then when you're done, you have all the chunks together, and that makes the gene you read, and you read that into a protein. OK, great. Now, before I get into all this other crazy stuff going on up here, let's go down to part B. So they didn't find much of a difference. In other words, if, if you were to look at, you know, let's go back up here again. If you were to look at exon 6 right here, exon 6, that's the sixth expressed piece of sequence, the actual code of the gene. And you were to take the sequence of exon 6, which is several hundred base ATCs and Gs, and you were to compare that sequence with, you know, a gorilla and a kangaroo. They're not that different. They're barely different at all. And it looks like they would make essentially the same protein. And so we would say that there really isn't much difference between mammals at that particular spot in the genome. It, 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 it plays some important function. The sequence isn't any different. And uh, so it's not that interesting right? We're more interested in differences, right? If you're trying to explain why one thing has a tail, another one doesn't have a tail, you need to find differences. <laughs> you can't make something different with something that's the same. And as far as you can tell, all the intra, all the, I'm sorry, the exons, the expressed sequences are not that different. They're not different enough to make a story, to, to, to provide an explain, explanation. So, but they had all the original code from the genome, and as they're lining it up, a very interesting thing suddenly appeared that they weren't really looking for. And this is the great thing about science, right? You're just exploring and you make observations. And then suddenly from that observation, you're like, hey, I have a hypothesis. I, I, have, an, I have a possible explanation for the phenomena that we observe of tails and no tails. And it comes from this crazy gap right here, right? So now I got to explain what you're looking at in figure B. Figure B shows, all right, here are the colorful boxes. This is where the pieces of code are for the gene itself, right? These are the, I'll say, these are the really important spots uh, because they make up the protein itself, all right? So those are great. And, and what we were saying is you can't really touch those. You can't really alter those very much uh, without drastically changing an organism uh, and its function. Uh, and there's evidence that those spots don't change very much. Look right here at the section below that. It's all pretty much black, um, especially exon 6 right here. You see exon 6 is pretty much mostly very dark under here. So what does dark mean? Black means that you have the same sequence. So right here, this is the portion of human chromosome number six. This little red line is like, that's where the gene is. Remember, your chromosome is 100 million base pairs long. It's huge. And you have lots of genes. And so we're saying, here's where this particular gene is. And then you're looking at a stretched out version of that gene. right? And then down here, you're saying, I'm going to compare the human version, the human DNA sequence itself from the human genome to a chimpanzee. And so this first line is chimpanzee all the way across. You see how it's very, very dark, uh, nearly black all the way across? Well, what that means is that the sequence for a chimpanzee is almost identical. Not only is it identical for, yeah, find my mouse. Not only is it identical where the genes are or where the gene sequences are, 
but it's actually almost identical in between the genes. So there's very little difference at all between a chimpanzee and a human. Uh, in fact, there's not much difference between chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons in this particular case. Although the gibbon actually has a missing chunk of sequence right here. That's what white is. White means it doesn't exist, right? It is missing that portion of the genome. All right. So it, it, as you look at other, these are other monkeys, three monkey, monkey, monkey. Uh, actually, all these are monkeys here. Um, and these are the most different form of monkeys. And if you get down to those, you'll see that it becomes, it becomes lighter gray. And that means the sequence is different. All right, so instead of having an A, sometimes they have a T. And sometimes instead of having a G, they have a C. Um, some of their sequence is the same, but they have spots where it's different. And so what they noticed was, and it should be glaringly obvious to you, is there is one really consistent difference between chimps, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons, all right, which happens to correspond to this group up here, right? And all the rest. And the difference is they have some sequence right here that doesn't exist in all the other primates. So the, all the other primates, they don't have any sequence there. They had to put a gap in this alignment as they align the sequence together because all the apes have an insertion of extra DNA. They have extra piece of their genome there. So then they be, so when you see a pattern like that and it corresponds to a phenomena and it's inside, it's in the area of a gene, it's not actually in the gene itself. You notice that the, the coding sequence is here and there's a coding sequence here. This is in an intron that normally we would say is spliced out and so shouldn't have that much effect on the final product of the gene. Uh, however, when you notice that there is a consistent difference between all the members that lack tails and ones that do have tails in a gene that we know has influence on tails, potentially, it certainly influences right spinal cord uh, type things right in very early development. That raised a very interesting question in these authors' minds when they notice that. I don't know which author particularly noticed this as they're trying to as they're just scanning and looking for stuff. But what they noticed was, is they asked, what is this sequence that's extra? And what they found is it's ALU, what they call ALUY. And ALU, if you don't know anything uh, uh, about human genome, ALU stands for, is, is, is an ALU transposon. So transposon. And transposons are pieces of genetic code which have the capacity to copy themselves from one location and insert themselves somewhere else. In other words, they can transpose, right? They can move. Uh, another name you may have heard uh, them called is jumping genes, all right? Because they can jump around in the genome and then insert themselves in different places in the genome. Uh, some people have described them as selfish DNA, all right, that they are like almost like independent uh, operators inside the genome, and they will move into other portions of the genome and copy themselves and proliferate almost, you know, you got to think of it as a virus inside the genome. So you can think of these pieces of sequence as really, um, it, as influent, well, not influencers. Well, I'm going to show you they do have influence in this particular case. But you can think of these little pieces of DNA as uh, their own independent agents inside of the genome. And you and I have a lot of these, right? There's over a million ALU transposons uh, in the human genome. Uh, and not everyone has exactly the same number, but we mostly have all the same ALU units um, with a few, with a, a slightly different, because there are some of them that are moving around still in human beings. Um, but for the most part, most of them are found in the same location. So for example, ALU SX1, so AL elements, these are about 300 base pairs long, 300 A, T, Cs, and Gs. They have distinctive code because at the ends of a transposon, so let's say this is the transposon, the, the chunk of inserted or new sequence, at the ends of them, they have sequence that is very conserved uh, and it is, uh, they're usually opposite sequences facing each other. 
So this is the same sequence on both ends. And it'll, this is what allows the sequence to find itself, cut itself out, and then be able to move to another location in the genome. And this is how we identify these particular spots in your genome because they have these repetitive sequences. And then in between, they often, they can have somewhat more unique sequences. But the fact is, out of those 300 base pairs, ALU-SX1 and ALU-SQ2 and ALU-Y, all three of those, which are inside of the TBXT larger portion of the gene, um, all have very similar sequence. So they're easily identifiable as these are ALU elements. These are transposons that are inside of this particular gene. So now look at the other two transposons, ALU SX1. Um, it is oriented in a particular direction, meaning the sequence has been inserted in a particular direction in the genome. And where it's found, everybody has it. So all the different primates have that particular ALU SX1. They might have slightly different sequence, but they all have a similar sequence and they're all identified by that family member. So ALU elements are usually divided into multiple different groups based on how similar they are to each other. And the idea is that one of them, when it copies itself and moves somewhere else and then has a mutation, it'll be very similar. And you can kind of trace back the history of ALU elements to look at how they have divided. Uh, and so they've kind of, it's like they form their own family tree inside of a species or inside of groups of organisms. Uh, and so ALU SX, and then there's SQ, so that's the ALU S family, and the S family has different varieties inside of it. And then there's the ALU Y family of transposons, so they're a little more distantly related from the S family. ALU SX1 is found in all primates at the exact same position in this gene. All right, so that's an element that's found at, you know, you can look at any primate and you'll find that particular piece of sequence always found in that particular spot. And then ALU-SX2, SQ2, sorry, is found over here on the other side of this particular, uh, well, actually on the other side of intron number seven, exon number seven. So this was, I've overwritten it, but this is six and seven. See, this is getting really complex. <laughs> I'm going to review all this it, it, to pull out the important points in a moment. So I'm kind of going through the big story here, and then we'll hone in on a few details. All right. We're getting uh, too many lines on here, so let's let's uh, erase all ink for a moment. Let's go back to, okay, so these, you could say that probably doesn't explain having a tail or not having a tail because everybody has one, all right? All primates have that. And this also, because every primate has that particular transposon inserted at the same point in its genome, that probably doesn't explain the tail loss versus uh, having a tail. However, as we've been pointing out, ALUY is unique. ALUY only exists or is only found in gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. That makes it very interesting. So then they ask the question, hmm, could this have any effect on the gene? Could this actually be disrupting the gene in some way, changing how it functions? And so they came up with this hypothesis. What they noticed is, you notice these little arrows? And I was saying one of them is facing this way. The, and ALUY happens to be facing the opposite direction. And what they, what they noticed was is that, you know, and knowing something about how genetics works, they realized that uh, ALUY is inserted in the gene. And then the other one is on the other side of this particular exon right here. That's exon number six. That's E6 right here, E6. And they said, you know what? When usually what happens is these two will get spliced out. These two introns will get spliced out and you put five and six and seven and you put them together, right? And then you read the code and you make the gene. But there can be a situation, and this is known from other genes as well, uh, and that I'm sure somebody who is working on this immediately recognized this was a possibility. Um, they recognize that what can happen is E5 can, you can take this whole piece. And if you take this whole piece and you start to make a copy of it, which is what you do, you make a copy from your nucleus. And now you have a single strand of this whole thing. The whole strand might fold back on itself. And the reason it would fold back on itself is because you have one of these sequences 
and the other sequence, which look like they're in opposite directions down here, right? Facing each other. But in fact, these are facing each other, right? This goes around and it'd be facing the other one. These sequences are complementary to each other because they have the same sequence, but now they're single stranded because you've copied the sequence into what's called a messenger RNA, which is a single strand. That single strand can fold back, and here is exon six right here, E6. It folds back on itself and it forms some bonds right here naturally because they have opposite sequences. They have, com well, complementary sequences, A's and T, C and G, and they all match up and they, they make this nice little matching pair. And then what can happen is, is that you can splice this whole thing out. The, 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 I, I don't have time to go into all this and you don't want me to. There's a mechanism, there's a, there's a machine basically that kind of cuts out the introns and splices together the, in, the exons to put together the gene in its final form. That mechanism, could cut out this entire thing, which would include exon six, which is part of the code of the of the gene itself, might get lost, and that's what they proposed. They said, because this new piece of sequence gets inserted here, it now forms a bond pair with this over here, and could cut this one out, resulting in well, what would you get if that happened? If that happened you would be lacking this blue piece of the gene. See right here, the blue piece is gone. Saying so, you know, under normal circumstances, you would make all these pieces of the gene and you put them all together and you'd read the gene. But here you have a situation where you could start to splice out the entire exon six, leaving it without one of the portions of the gene, in which case when you read the code, you're gonna read it and you're gonna be missing a piece of the gene. And if you're missing a piece of the gene, you're going to make a different protein. If you make a different protein, it's probably going to have a different function. Uh, and so what they propose is that if you're missing this portion of the gene, uh, you're going to possibly result in not having a tail. Whereas other animals, which don't have this other facing uh, a piece of uh, uh, transposon, they don't splice out their exon six. So they make a full length version of the gene and they then do development correctly. At least, you know, that we're gonna say that that is the, the normal way of doing things. Uh, using using exon six because it exists is what you would think is that's the normal state of things, right? Uh, and so the normal state would be, hey, make a tail because that's what this gene does. It helps you make a tail. Oh, over here, oops, I've got this added piece of DNA, which now matches this other piece of DNA over here. And now it starts to do something which it shouldn't be doing. And now all of a sudden, now you're not able to make a tail. All right, so now that's the hypothesis, right? All we've done is generated a hypothesis for why this particular gain or this new piece of code, or let's just say the existence of this code inside the TBXT gene could make a physical difference in the organism when they use this particular gene. So that's this is the hypothesis. So now that's that's wonderful. You might say like, oh, you yeah, know, that could be, but how do you know? Well, they didn't stop here. They actually went and they tested this idea. Right now, obviously they can't test this on people and like, make this particular error or or change something about a person itself but there's a whole bunch of different ways we can test this in cells and we can test it by in other uh organisms like mice and we can see if we can generate a condition of no tails through this prediction and that's what makes this paper really amazing is uh just to give away the the the, the some of the the, the, the final parts they go in and they remove exon six from a mouse through gene editing technology. They remove this portion of the gene because mice have the same gene that you and I have, and they have an exon six and exon five and exon seven, and they're basically in the same places and they have the same sequence, very similar sequence. They remove exon six and then they, from an embryo, and then they grow that embryo and they make a mouse. And what do you know? the mouse doesn't have a tail, or some of the mice have very, very short tails and disrupted tails. Uh, and so they essentially prove in a biological system 
that if you alter the expression of this gene, removing the exon six and allowing the organism only to have the other six, the other seven exons and put them together, you change the final outcome of the organism in terms of their morphology. All right, but we've got a little ways to get to that. All right, so let's let's go through this again. And it, it, unfortunately, it's a little more complicated than than even what I just said. Um, so let's go up here first. And uh, so again, the colorful boxes represent all the pieces of the gene that are in the original DNA. But now what you're looking at is you can go through and there's a technology where you can go into cells, like you go into an embryo, you can take a mouse embryo, take some cells from it, and you can extract their RNA that's been processed. And processed RNA would mean they've taken out all the introns and they've just spliced it together. And so they've spliced together all their pieces of gene. And after they splice them all together, they should have, like you should be able to see, like what's the final version of the gene they're gonna read and make into a protein. Uh, and so there's a way to copy that that's called RT-PCR. Uh, and so then you can assess the length of that gene. And the length of the gene will tell you, are they using all their parts or are they missing a part? Um, in this case, oh, I'm sorry. In this case, we're not even talking about mice. We're actually going to talk about taking uh, cells from human beings that are grown in tissue culture. Uh, and we're going to activate this particular gene in those particular cells. Uh, so we're going to look at this directly in human beings, although not, you know, in on in cell lines. And so we're going to take those cells and we're going to influence them to turn on this particular gene and see what they do with it. And what we find is, sure enough, humans make a full length product in which you could predict if you put all the pieces together, it should make a certain length and they see it. But you could also, and this is what they did, right? They predicted, let's go down here. They predicted that this particular transpose on this jumping gene, this jumping piece of DNA that got stuck in here is going to interact with this other one on the other side of exon six, potentially you know, causing it to be spliced out. And if it does that, whoops, wrong one here. If it does that, there should be some pieces of RNA that are produced in human beings that are missing exon six. And here's your proof. When they copied the sequence out of human cells, they found that some of them were smaller and the size was small enough that it was exactly the amount that it would be if they didn't have an exon six. That is very strong evidence that in human cells, human beings are making this product and they're missing exon six. But it gets even wilder than that. ALUSQ2 uh, transpose on is also in the opposite direction as SK1, which means you could make an even larger loop, right? The loop would go from here all the way over to here. And if you do that so that this one is this one and this one is this one, you would then have exon six and exon seven both inside of your loop, right? And then you would potentially cut this whole thing out, in which case you would make a final gene product that is missing both those exons. So that's what the delta is. Delta means change exon six and seven. Um, and as a result, the gene is even shorter. And here's what we saw. There's a very light band here, meaning there are some transcripts in human cells that are missing two exons. And so the really interesting thing here is that human beings are making all three different versions. Now, as a broader lesson, this is why multicellular animals, especially vertebrate animals, are far more complex than some other organisms uh, because they have the capacity to do what's called um, uh, exon shuffling, or in this case, uh, exon removal. And so they can take the same gene. In other words, you have, what is it? You've got this gene here, right? Right? All mammals have this gene, but some mammals can remove exon six and some can remove exon six and exon seven. And depending on what cells they do that in, they might have a different effect. So you have the same gene, but you can make three different transcripts from it. And, and by the way, making three different transcripts means you make three different proteins. You have one gene and you can make three different proteins. So that's, if you learned in 
high school biology that one gene makes one product because that's sort of the, the central dogma of genetics. You've got a gene and you copy it and then you make it into a protein. So one for, for every gene you have, you have a, a piece of DNA. Uh, I'm sorry, for every protein you have, you have one gene that makes that protein. Well, this should dispel that uh, um, uh, misconception, right? We know that there are many genes for which you can make multiple products from that gene and you can express those proteins in different parts of your body. So maybe in one part of your body, you're, you're using like the shorter version and another part of your body, you're using a different version of the gene. All right. So they go on and they, they do a bunch of other things like they, they intentionally take out ALUY. So like if you go into the human version that has ALUY and you say like, hey, let's get rid of it. So you can do this in cells, right? You can use gene editing technology. You can remove ALUY. Oh, I got to get rid of this uh, ink again. You could like use gene editing technology, get rid of that, in which case you would predict you would predict that you would no longer be able to make this loop anymore and you wouldn't be able to cut out that. And yes, that's what happens. If you cut out ALUY, what do you see? Oh, look at this. All of a sudden, what disappears? What disappears is the transcript you, you that many human cells usually can make, they no longer can make it anymore because they're missing ALUY. So there's your evidence that um, this particular sequence right here, ALUY, is actually, in fact, interacting with ALUSX1 some of the time. What does all of this have to do with tails? Oh, yeah, I forgot I had this slide. I should have, I should have pointed this out earlier. So, uh, so you may still be confused about my whole language of introns and exons, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at trying to explain that. Here's a, let's just say this is a gene, and this is just a, like a typical gene. The gene has exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, exon 4. Those are the expressed portions of the code. That's the code that makes a protein. But between them, there are intervening sequences. And so what happens is you do transcription. You transcribe something into an RNA. And we call it a pre-RNA because it's the original RNA that's made. And it still has the introns in it. But then you cut out through what's called splicing and through a machine mechanism, some, sometimes a mechanism called a spliceosome. And you cut out these pieces, and you're left with exon one, two, three, and four all attached together. So that, and then what you do from that is you 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 read it with the ribosome, you translate it into the final product, which is a protein. Now, what did I say about TBXT? I said TBXT is a transcription factor, but it actually is a protein. It's a protein that influences this process right here. It influences whether you're going to turn on transcription or translate, uh, sorry, transcription, or maybe suppress transcription, make sure it doesn't happen. Um, and it is composed of eight exons that all have to be spliced together. And the exon we've been talking about is exon six. We've been saying, if you don't make exon six, potentially you can't, you know, you, you, know, you make a different protein. And if you make this different protein, maybe you can't make a tail, as opposed to if you had the protein, you could make the tail. All right, so let's think about what we're seeing here before I get to the mice. Um, what we're saying is, is that um, in, if you sequence a human being and you look at their sequence, um, you can find, actually you can find two different sequences. If you look at what they're actually using, uh, and that was in my previous slide with the PCRs, what you'll see is that they do make a full length protein and then they make a protein that is missing exon 6. So this whole section right here is exon 6. And now you don't see ATs and Cs and Gs. You see a W, L, L, P, Y. Those are, those are the amino acids that make up the protein. So you're looking at the protein alignment. And so human beings make one without, and we also make one with the, the, the exon 6. So we can skip it or not skip it, uh, and sort of, or a mixture of that inside of cells. Um, and then if you look at something like a cat, all right, here's cat, here's a dog, here's a mouse, here's a rat, all right? And then all of these are other primates. Um, you can see that our exon sixes are not that dissimilar. So in terms of the actual exon six itself, we have almost the same sequence, um, humans and chimpanzees, let's see here. We actually do differ at one, two different spots. 
two different amino acids, um, but those have been shown to not really have any, uh, any effect on the protein function itself. Um, and all these other primates as well have very similar sequences and so forth. So uh, what does this gene do? Here again are the different sections. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Exon six is the one we're caring about right now, seven and eight. And if you were to ask, what does the protein do? So if you fold this protein up, there's a section of it, it's called the DNA binding uh, domain. That just means you have DNA sequence and this protein, right? This area of the protein can bind the DNA. So it can look at the DNA, see certain DNA sequences and say like, I'm gonna stick to the DNA right there. And then after it sticks to the DNA right there, there's another portion of the gene protein. All right, so let's go back. All right, let's say we got this protein. So we have this area of the protein that binds to the DNA. And then there's other areas of the protein, right? Which are like TA1, that's transcription activator. And TRs are transcription repressors. So you might have an activator and a repressor. Well, what do those do? Well, an activator and repressor is, an activator might be a place where if you stick another protein to this, it, it may be attached to another protein, and that protein uh, binds to the DNA, turns on transcription, and you read the gene. You say like, yes, we need to make this gene right now. We're in this stage of development. Let's go ahead. It activates it. But there are other portions of the sequence. So you make another protein in it, like later in development, say 10 days later, you make another protein somewhere else in the genome. That protein happens to bind to the repressor, right? Not the activator. And when it binds to the repressor, what happens? The repressor causes this protein to be here and it stops transcription. It says, you no longer need to use this gene. We're gonna repress this gene. We're gonna stop it from being used. Now, you see where exon six is? Exon six is right here. So exon six makes a portion of this protein. Let's just say it's, uh, let's get a different color out here. Yeah. Let's say exon six is this portion of the protein right here. And it's part of a, it's part of TA1. It's also part of TR2. It, it influences, it changes the activator and the repressor. So potentially changes how this gene functions because it's now missing that portion of the protein. Uh, and that's gonna change downstream effects. All right, now we're ready to look at the hypothesis made by this paper before we go back to the mice. So what they propose is, they say the simplest, explana the simplest explanation for the observation they have made and the observation was um, all the hominoids have a particular sequence. They have this ALUY, right? A distinctive sequence that they have that is missing in all the other primates. And so they suggest that at some point back in history, there was a primate, right? This primate right here that has a tail. Um, and then this jumping gene in one of those primates um, they had an event because this is what happens with these jumping genes. Most of them are very stable and they stay in the same position and you just and they're just copied over and over and over from one generation and passed to the next generation. My kids have all the same ALU elements that I have probably all in the same location. But once in a while, the ALU unit, unit is activated. Uh, it copies itself out of some other place in the genome and then inserts itself and makes a new copy somewhere else. In this case, it makes a copy right here. And this could just be a random insertion. It's not like it knew where it was going to go. It simply is scanning down the genome. It's like, oh, I'm going to insert myself here. And when it did that, what did it do? It created this combination of opposite, similar transposons on either side of an exon, which then tripped on this effect of it being spliced out. And because it got spliced out, you now have a different protein that has a different effect. And this is a super important gene really early on, like in the first days, like, like, like day 10 to day 35 or something like that of a developing embryo. Uh, and it's changing the way that it's influencing development um, of the, the midrib, the, the, 
the primordial streak and eventually the the notochord and um, uh, backbone. And and as a result, some of the offspring of that individual that it shares this new ALU element with lack tails, right? So developmentally lack tails, maybe some of them actually have a changed tail. So maybe they have a stubby tail. Maybe some of them have longer tails. I'll go into the genetics of that uh, in a moment. It has to do with the fact that if, if you have this mutation only happen in one copy of the gene, one copy, not both, right? You get two copies of all your genes, one from mom and one from dad. And so the original mutation would have only been in one parent. Uh, and so it's a heterozygote, meaning you have one normal copy and one version that's this mutation. But then over time, what happens is they suggest that natural selection, maybe in these particular primates, is like they didn't really need their tails. Well, maybe it's like their tails weren't all that useful because of the habitat they were in. And so any animal that inherited the inability to make a tail uh, was selected for. And then, of course, uh, there's also going to be other mutations uh, in other genes or in other locations in this particular gene that give it make it slightly more efficient over time. And so eventually what happens is every single descendant over time eventually has this particular uh, ALU element in it. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Has this one in it. Getting messy again. All right. And that's why that's their explanation for why every single every single ape that's been sequenced has ALUY at exactly this particular location in the genome because they've all inherited it from a common ancestor. Started in one spot, and they're saying all these other primates are descendants, and they all shared this common ALU element in the same spot because they got it from a common ancestor. All right, now, um, let's continue to test this idea is there further evidence that this particular gene really is at the core, like one of the root, it might be like the primary responsibility, it might be the, the original mutation. Is the insertion or addition of ALUY the thing that causes short tails? So they went in and they said, look, we can do another test, right? If, if this exon six is really important, and if, we, if you don't have exon six, that affects the tail production. We can test that on mice. So what they do is they use CRISPR-Cas9, which is the whole gene editing technology that's this new thing from the last decade. Uh, I think uh, probably not even a decade old yet. Uh, they go in and they basically, and that's what the little scissors are for, they basically snip out exon 6. They develop little things that go in, find both sides of exon 6, and it's like, chop, chop, let's just get rid of this thing. And they do that in the embryo of a mouse. So then they end up with a mouse that has, um, they end up, and remember, you have two copies. So here, here's a mouse cell in, in every cell. And the cell has the gene TBXT, TBXT, and TB, hello, that was really messy, TBXT. They have two copies of it. And what they find is, is that if one copy is missing, we'll say missing exon 6, and one has normal, all right? One's normal. Uh, if you're just missing it in one, here's what you get. You get tails with da -da, either very short tails or virtually no tail at all, right? See, missing exon six and plus means normal. Um, and plus plus would be a normal mouse uh, that has two active versions that make the complete gene and they have long tails. Now you might ask, well, what about the mice that are missing, um, that are, are EX6, are change EX6 uh, times change yeah, or loss EX6. They are missing it from both of their genes. Well, it turns out uh, they die, all right? So uh, that's lethal to not be able to have an exon 6 at all. Um, now, what happened here? And he's like, oh, but that's lethal. So wouldn't that have been a huge problem? Well, this is what they've done here is a little different. I just said that they went in and they just cut it out. And they said, you don't make one at all. Now, what did I say earlier? Didn't I point out earlier that uh, in humans, it's been shown directly in cell lines, tested cell lines, that human beings that have this mutation, they have ALUI. Um, 
they sometimes make this bridge, they sometimes cut out exon 6, and they sometimes make a short version of the gene and a short protein. That's what we're showing here. Here it is. They make a transcript that's shorter. But they also make the full length one. So sometimes they're making the full length one. You see how it's different than the mouse model? So in the mouse model, all they do is they just cut it out altogether, in which case they are literally incapable of making a normal version of this gene. And as a result, they only make the shorter version of the gene. And if that's all they can make from both parents, so they're a, what's called a homozygote, and they both have copies of the defective version, well, they can't. They have more problems than just not being able to make a tail. They have all kinds of neurological problems. Um, so how does this? Ex so how do we explain this in terms of primates or, or um, great apes and human beings specifically? Um, what we're saying is that. You and I, and this is actually is your genetic condition and my genetic condition and genetic condition of what we think every single person on the earth is, is that you and I are both, we, we have both copies. Both copies have A-L-U-Y, A-L-U-Y, A-L-U-Y. So you have one copy from mom and one copy from dad. And as a result, you have that you have the two different transposons on either side of, we'll call this exon six up here. So this is, we'll call this exon six. You have transposons on both sides, but this evidence over here says it doesn't always cut out exon six. So you're not completely without exon six. You make some normal version of this protein, but you also make some shorter version of this protein. And so in early development, you are, you, are, you are developing using a different combination of this gene, a short version and a long version. And those two things together are not lethal, but they do have a, an effect on morphology. And that is they reduce or stunt the development of a mature tail. They don't stop development of tail production at all completely because in the embryo, the embryo develops a tail, but then the process isn't pushed through to completion because of something about making these short versions of this protein. Um, now that isn't fully investigated exactly where all that happens, which that would be hard to investigate because you, you, I mean, you can't do that on human uh, fetal cells or, or feti, feti uh, themselves. Um, in tissue culture, you can see individual cells and what they're doing, but you're not seeing them in development in the same way. Um, so what you have here is every single human being is making a mixture of different proteins. In fact, we're even making a mixture of we're missing exon 6 and exon 7, right? Because that's what this was showing too. You have three different copies of the gene, three different proteins you're making from a single gene. Um, whereas if you go and you look at a primate with a normal tail, Right? Oh, I don't, why am I even trying to draw that? Crazy. Scratch that out. If you're trying to, you know, if you have a normal tail, um, what you're making is you don't have ALUY. And as a result, you're making a full length protein all the time. And that's telling you complete the making a tail, right? You're going to make the complete tail because that's all the only message we have. Right, we're making the same protein all the time. We're going to constantly be expressing this, and therefore, well, remember what it does it's a transcription factor, so it's either activating or repressing in a consistent way over the entire uh, time of development, resulting in the production of a mature, complete tail. Okay, now I, I know that was a lot. Right, that's that's a whole bunch of fairly complicated genetics. I hope that gives you an appreciation for uh, how very small changes in a genome can have very dramatic effects. Because in my original image, I was showing that uh, really all primates have essentially the same sequence. We have the same genes. Uh, the genes are in the same uh, order of exons. The exons have nearly the same sequence. The product they make in terms of the protein is all the same. 
uh, if you just look at it in terms of raw code. But then when you go in and say, oh yeah, but you know what? There are other things in the genome, which some people would call junk DNA, right? They would say like, oh, that spacer between that gene, between those two exons, the intron, that's just wasted stuff that's cut out. Um, no, that's not really junk, right? If that particular code can influence another piece of code, which then can result in a different splicing, which loses an exon, well, then you've actually affected the phenotype of the organism. The phenotype is like the product that's made from the gene itself. And so these very small, what looks look, which could look inconsequential, remember I told you, you have one million, I, I didn't say before, but 10% of your genome are ALU transposons, just little pieces of 300 base pair sequences that are just all over your chromosomes. Most of those don't appear to have any function at all. Um, they're not inserted in places that have any effect on turning genes off and on. This one just happens to be inserted in a very important place that then causes function to occur. Now, if you want to see this as a, um, as a new insertion, then what this truly is, is it's a new piece of information because it is adding to what this gene can do. This gene before could only make all eight exons, put them all together and make one protein. But then when you add this new element, you're like, oh, well, I could make the whole gene with all eight exons and put them all together, or I could take out exon six and now I can make seven exons and make a different protein, which has a somewhat different function and therefore have a different phenotype. Um, and so that shows that individual pieces of DNA reorganized in a genome can have really dramatic effects. All right, I've been holding on this screen for a while and you're probably reading it, so I probably should talk about it, right? So what are the possible Young Earth creationist responses to the evidence I've just presented and this whole idea that how should they think about, did Adam and Eve have tails originally? So here's, here's what I'm suggesting. Adam and Eve could have been created with a fully functional version of this gene. But then sin caused disruptions in their genome. And this is just, this is what young earth creationists suggest, right? You can read it throughout their literature. Because of sin, uh, genetic entropy occurs. Genetic entropy is mutations are happening. Mutations happen randomly through the genome. They knock out genes. They disrupt the, the genome. They cause all these diseases that we see. Um, and so their descendants may have been caused that, oh, oh, I'll go back here. In, this disrupted their genome and one or more of their descendants caused the gene to become disrupted, resulting in the loss of human tails, right? If God created man with a few ALU elements, right? Transposable genes, or maybe they didn't even have, maybe man didn't, even, I, I, I think that probably there's some creationists who think that that man didn't even have transposable elements because they do see them as jumping genes and disruptors. Um, some see them as creators. So, I mean, there's all different responses to these things. But if they didn't have all of the ALU elements and they're saying that, okay, now after, after, after sin comes into the world, one of the disruptions to the human genome is that the ALU transposons begin to move around and they begin to disrupt the human genome. One of those disruptions could be jumping into the TBXT gene, then causing this effect of removing the exon 6 partially from being expressed, resulting in a mutation. But that is a mutation, right? Because it changed the function of the protein. And now this protein doesn't do what it originally was designed to do, which is make a tail. And now it's not making a tail. So not making a tail is a mutation. It's a degradation of the original perfect creation. So in this way, you could look at it as the original creation, Adam and Eve had tails. After all, all the other animal, every other vertebrate that God created also had tails um, at some point in their, in, their, in, their pro, in their development. And as I said before, 99.9% .9 of all the other animals that are bilateral or, or, or vertebrate animals have tails, mature tails. And so 
just on the face of it, you'd say, why not? Why couldn't Adam and Eve also had tails plus chimpanzees and, and gorillas and so forth, the other exceptions? Maybe they originally had tails as well, and then they lost them. So this would be an example of genetic decay. Uh, Ken Ham should go for that, right? He often points to examples of losses of features of various organisms and points to them and says, see, God created these organ animals with more perfect traits, more complete characteristics. And now all we see is characteristics are lost, right? He says, you never gain new characteristics, you only lose them. Um, and so uh, this, would only, this, would, this would fit his profile, right? So rather than just proclaiming or saying or believing that Adam and Eve couldn't possibly have had a tail, why not say the preponderance of evidence is they did have tails, and they had a mutation and lost those tails, right? That would fit your worldview of how the world has changed uh, since Adam and Eve. Now, another option is humans were created with a gene capable of producing tail production, but was designed for the beginning to be turned off in human beings, All right? So God made humans with this gene TBXT, which is capable, if you put all the pieces together, of making a tail. But then he designed it to not function as well as it possibly could. I'll put it that way. All right? How ALU humans were created in this gene of Adam and Eve, just as we see them today. God placed it. In other words, he put the ALUY copy of the transposon into this gene. And he put them there to alter the function of this gene in humans, but also in other hominoid primates, because you'd also have to do that in all the other primates that don't have tails, right? Because I've already shown they have the same ALUY segment and the same exact position in their genomes. And so as he creates them, which uh, remember for Ken Ham, uh, he only had to create um, you know, one other type of great ape, and that great ape then shared this ALUY with its descendants. Because remember, I, I know this sounds a little wild, but uh, this is what, what the Answers in Genesis is promoting, that um, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, all came from a common ancestor. So God just created one of those, uh, a, a primordial ancestral version of all those, and then they evolved into all those different uh, great apes. And so all he would have to do is one time put the ALUY element in there so that they wouldn't make a tail, and then they would share that with all their descendants. Um, either way, um, young earth creationists have, I, 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 they have a challenge explaining data like I've just presented, right? Because here you have a common feature between these different primates. Uh, if they don't share common ancestry, you have the question of why do they all share the feature in the same spot? And I guess you could say common design, but even common design, why do they have a design that includes exon six uh, when God probably could have found ways to do it without having exon six? Why have this incredibly complicated mechanism of splicing out different exons uh, to cause tails not to form if you just didn't want to have tails to begin with? In other words, what you observe in the genetic record or the genetic fossil record, you could say, is as we look at these organisms, is that you see that they have all the capacity to make a tail if it weren't for this one additional added piece of DNA. Uh, and taking that piece of DNA away, they would just have normal tails. Now, I don't want to pretend like it's that simple. You're, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, why don't we just mutate? Why don't we get rid of ALUY? And then shouldn't we see humans pop out with tails? And would they look? what would they look like? Um, it's thought that after this particular mutation, once you can't make a tail, it's not like this gene would be alone. This would be like the primary influencer because it's a, it's a gene that influences other genes. But then other genes would have, like because they're no longer being used in the same way, they would also incur mutations that would make them more efficient for generating the thing that replaces having a tail. Uh, and so if you were to just change ALUY and remove it from the human genome, it's unlikely that descendants would suddenly have tails. Um, 
they might have some other odd feature that was weirdly tail-like, but it wouldn't be exactly like other primate tails. So it's been a, a long, strange trip here to <laughs> address the question, did Adam and Eve have tails? And you, you might be thinking, hey, what does Joel Dove think? Um, yeah, really, I don't think Adam and Eve had tails, and I have no expectation that they, they would have. I'm just saying if I put myself into the young earth creationist mind and and looking at their literature and asking the question, what would they expect? Um, sure, I think it's a natural response to say that you would expect Adam and Eve to look very similar to us. Um, but young earth creationists have been suggesting that all kinds of other animals looked very different in the original in their original created form. Right? And then they had original created form, they diversified, they went through the flood, they got bottlenecked, and then they diversified into many species that look radically different than their original form. And so with that, why would we expect that human beings should look exactly like human beings today? Haven't they potentially lost features as well? Because again, I look in the young earth creationist literature and all I see them talking about is genetic entropy and how human beings are basically falling apart. Right, we're we're riddled with diseases. We have um, we have features that we no longer use in the same way we might have used in the past. That's one of the explanations for vestigial organs or organs that we don't fully use in the same way anymore. That they're essentially decaying. Um, and so it's not really a stretch to say that Adam and Eve might have had a tail, and maybe some of their descendants did, and then one of them had this you know had this genetic event of a jumping gene, which we know happened because they happened today, uh, and it jumped into just the right spot, creating this new morphological condition of lacking a tail. Their descendants then passed that on. They also lack tails. Um, oh, the one thing I, I forgot to cover was I was going to go over the genetics, the basic Mendelian genetics of it. But in the very first mutation, you'd be a heterozygote, one copy that has a mutation, one that doesn't, right? One that has the insertion of the ALU, one that doesn't. Uh, and that might have created a, a, a slightly less obvious tail. Um, and then if that individual that had that tail that wasn't fully formed had offspring, and they have offspring, right? They start to spread that particular mutation, that particular insertion. As there's more offspring, some of those offspring then mate with each other, in which case, what can happen? You can bring two individuals that both have the mutation into one and have an offspring that is both have the mutation. And because they now are both lacking some ability to use exon six, and they're not making a lot of the fully expressed version of the protein, they would lack tails completely. Um, but be, you know, normal in the sense of it's not a genetic mutation that causes them harm. And as a result, they might have children then, which will also lack tails. And eventually you get to a situation where everybody lacks a tail, uh, especially if you have, you know, Noah's family lacks tails. And then they're the, uh, you know, all their offspring are in the young earth creationist worldview, all the people that are alive today. It's not out of the realm of possibility. And so I think it would behoove them not to simply just, you know, throw this out as like, well, that's ridiculous. Of course, Adam and Eve didn't have tails. Uh, why? Of course. <laughs> you know, so, like, like the, the genes seem to exist for making tails. And embryologically, we do make tails uh, at some point. So uh, it just just from a purely like factual point of view, it would be, it, it, Ken Ham should be emphasizing that human beings do have tails because a 10 week old um, fetus is as much a human being as any of us are human beings. And if that fetus were to die at 10 weeks, we would say that fetus has a tail, right? And they're a human being and therefore human beings have tails. Um, I am just asking the further question, could in the original creation for young earth creationists, couldn't they imagine that the original created human beings had full-fledged tails as adults? Um, again, I don't find any reason to believe that that's necessary. 
Um, and young earth creationists don't have to believe that that's true. I just think they can't exclude it because in the final analysis, what's Ken Ham there? Does he have a personal witness? Does he know someone? Does he know a piece of scripture that can directly tell us whether Adam and Eve had a tail or not? And if he can't, he simply can't say that Adam and Eve couldn't have had a tail. Um, okay, that's my story. And uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the molecular biology lesson. Uh, any further questions about it, hey, leave me a comment and I will, I will attempt to answer it in 100 words or less. That's going to be a big challenge. All right, thanks a lot. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.